Good morning. <laughs> okay, I am going to start with a true story. Um, I have changed the names and faces to protect the innocent, but everything that I'm going to share with you has actually happened. So this is Michael, and Michael heads up the solutions delivery team for a large transport and freight organisation in Sydney. Now, early this year in February, one hot morning, Michael drives into work, steers his car into the car park, as usual, grabs his briefcase from the back seat and makes his way to the coffee shop. What Michael didn't know was that at that precise moment, his managing director was finishing a meeting with his CFO and he was learning that this quarter's numbers were very, very poor. So when Michael strolls into his office, his managing director is there waiting for him. And the managing director says, Michael, we have a problem and you are going to fix it for me. Our costs are up, our volume is down, our service levels are appalling, and it's because we've got a data issue with our freight management. I don't care who you take, but I want you to lock yourself in the boardroom for the next four hours and to give me an answer at the end of the day. Okay, suddenly, somebody say, the S word? Yes, definitely. So suddenly, Michael has a problem. Okay, so what does he do? Does he just do what the MDs asked him to do? Or does he do something different? Now, here's the thing. He knows that there's been a team that's been working on this issue for three weeks. They haven't cracked it. Okay, so the chances of Michael locking himself in a room and solving it in four hours are slim at best, regardless of who he takes with him into that room. So what he does is he gathers up his confidence, he goes out on the ledge and he suggests something different to the ND that he thinks is going to deliver a more innovative solution. So the interesting thing to me is why take the risk, okay? The reason he took the risk is because four months earlier he'd completed extreme thinking and he knew that science had his back. So what was it in extreme thinking that he learned? What was the extreme thinking? What is it? And what was the experience? So the first thing that leaders who walk into an extreme thinking workshop will see is a big blank brain and some coloured markers. And at that point, they'd probably go prefer to go base jumping than stay in the room. But what I ask them to do is to actually draw me how they think they think. Okay? I'm not testing their science knowledge. I'm not interested if they know the technical names of the parts of their brain. I am interested in how they think they think. And I am interested in knowing how they solve problems. So for Michael, this is what his drawing looked like. There's lots of stuff happening outside. He's got money he has to make. He's got kids. He's got work. He's got operations across an organisation the size of 7,000 people. So it all goes in here. It comes in as a big mass of flux. And he has been raised, the way that I've been raised, is that what you do with that is you chunk it down into its component bits and you, through a process of analytical deduction, deductive reasoning, you generate some options, you evaluate them, and then you make the right call. Sound familiar? You've warmed them up well, Darren. Um, so how many people have been taught that process for problem solving? Okay, don't let me down now. Great, thank you. Now, what's interesting about this process is it's brilliant, okay, brilliant. But it works best when, we, when the problem we're dealing with is familiar, the variables are known or they're predictable, there is a clear line of sight between cause and effect. 
Okay. What we were discovering is it doesn't work quite as well when you've never seen the problem. You can't predict the variables. There are multiple uh, possibilities and the line of sight is just not that visible between cause and effect. The other thing we learnt about this kind of problem solving is that it's not the greatest way to solve problems that need creativity. When you want to create something that's new, out of the box, which we all love to say in the corporate world, it doesn't serve us quite as well. So what extreme thinking does, it's a technique that teaches leaders how to increase their aha moments. It's a technique designed to unlock the creative genius that actually resides in our mind. And when I say creativity, leaders are constantly saying to me, but I'm not creative. Okay, how many people think that about themselves? Yeah, and I think it's because we've been brought up with the idea that creativity is about art. It's not. Thank you for the people who just gave me some sound on that. Okay, it is not about art. The essence of creativity is the ability to see something new, a fresh take on an existing problem, a shift in perspective, and we're, we all qualified to do that. We love, in the business community, to, to go for this out-of-the-box thinking. We love the promise of creative thinking and innovation. We're just a little bit fuzzy on what to do to make it happen. Being the good analysts that we are, we've been brought up on the idea that analytical thinking is thinking. So what creative, what extreme thinking does is to teach a different approach. We don't want to abandon our analytical roots, we want to keep them, but we want to add to our mental toolkit. And extreme thinking is a tool to be used to unlock curiosity and actually translate those issues into creative solutions. So this is insight-based problem solving, and insight is probably along with disruption, one of the most used words at the moment. So let's be clear about what we mean. So in the neuroscience literature, the insight is defined as the ability to have a clear and deep understanding of a complex problem or situation. What's interesting about an insight is even though this aha moment happens to all of us, when you look at the research around it, there are some def definite characteristics that go with aha moments. One, it usually follows a period of frustration. Two, it usually is unbidden and unexpected. Three, it, we get the whole solution in one go. Four, it feels like it, it's, we're certain it will work and it feels good, okay? We get a positive jolt of um, a positive level of energy. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this is that there takes the whole brain to produce that moment, but it's apparent that the unconscious mind is probably the primary key player. Okay. So, what do we mean by the unconscious mind? The unconscious mind is a part of our mind that actually drives most of how we feel and what we do on a day-to-day -day level. Scientists have measured the bandwidth, okay, measured the bandwidth of the unconscious mind and they've worked out that the unconscious mind processes 11 million bits of data per second versus the conscious mind processing 40 in the same amount of time. That's a mind flex, yeah? Okay, so, by the way, non-conscious, unconscious, subconscious, same thing, okay? It's what happens that is out of our awareness. Now, what is the unconscious mind? Well, it is the part of you that is noticing that your edge of your thigh is pressing up against the seat. 
It's the part of you that's telling you that you've been sitting for about an hour and your backside's getting a bit numb and you're going to need to shift. It's the part of you that's tracking the way you're inhaling air through your left nostril. And your conscious mind is a part of you that's just realised all of that stuff's true. Okay. So, if we're going to develop a technique to teach leaders how to increase their aha moments, we need to understand what, what, how does it happen? How do those moments happen? So there were three things at the beginning of the research as we were setting up for this that we knew from science. We know that any technique will have to lower the amount of activity in the front part of our brain. And those of you who have done a bit of neuroscience will know that that's the prefrontal cortex and that's the part of the brain that does the heavy lifting in terms of problem solving and decision making. We also know that if you're going to have an aha moment, it's more likely to happen if you are in a positive mood. We know that anxiety blocks the aha moment. If anybody has ever been put on the spot and asked a question, you know that time when you know you know the answer, but it's on the tip of your tongue and you can't access it? That's usually a form of anxiety that's just running interference with your ability to access that information. So positive mood's important, and we know that the state of mind that we're in will either help our insight or it will block our insight. So. In 2012, we worked with a neuroscientist and a lecturer from University of Technology, Dr. Tricia Stratford. And in her PhD research, she'd, she'd found that there were, or identified three levels of mind. The first is fragmented mind. So that's the state of mind where you feel cluttered, maybe you're feeling tense and you're stressed and you're triggered and you're in survival mode. For those of you who are familiar with our tools and the circumplex, this is deep red and green territory. We just can't think straight. Now, the brain waves that dominate at that level are beta brain waves, busy beta, very fast. In a good amount, it helps us be alert, alert but if we've got too much, it stresses us out. Gets in, gets in the way of our thinking. Now, when our mind slows, we move to the next level of mind, which is that state of flow. And the brain waves that prevail there are alpha waves. So they're fuller, they're slower, they relax us. So suddenly that tunnel vision that came from that threat state opens up and we can see possibilities. Now, the state of mind that I became obsessed with and HS became obsessed with was the third state of mind, which is a state of mind, Tricia, called supermind. The quantum effect is that little signals, little things make a big difference. At the level of supermind, you've got a prevailing gamma brain waves, which are the fastest, but in terms of state of mind, that's where we have free-flowing ideas, we have access to visionary thinking, and we have, it's a very energising state. So, what do we know? We've got to decrease beta brains in the front part of the brain. We've got to lift people's mood and we're looking for an increase in gamma brain waves to try and facilitate this aha moment. So, we had to come up with a working theory about how to get to aha. So, what we did was to sit down, look at all the research, and one of the things that we knew is that if aha moments follow a period of frustration, then maybe that frustration has something to do with making aha. So we believe that that frustration comes from something we call the try harder cycle. And the try harder cycle is when you've got a problem and you've got a deadline. Okay, if you can fix the problem, no issue, okay? But if you can't fix the problem and you've still got the deadline, that becomes an issue. So what happens in the try harder cycle, we've got a problem, we can't think of a solution, even though we've tried everything we know, so we work late, we have lots more coffee, we skip the gym, we try solutions that might have worked for other things. If it still doesn't work, 
then we get frustrated and we go, ah, oh, walk away. And what happens when we walk away? Bang, we get the aha. So we think that what happens here is that we knowledge load. An aha moment favours a well-stocked mind. And so we consult Dr Google, we're reading, we're talking to people and Professor Wikipedia. And so what we're doing is putting all this information in our mind, but here's the rub. You aren't going to solve it from here because your stress levels are up. Fragmented mind. You cannot get breakthrough thinking from this process. So what we developed was a process we called ARCS, A-R-C-S. And what this ARCS is designed to do is to circuit break that try harder cycle. It also gives leaders very concrete things that they can do at that point where you're really just stuck on a complex issue or you want to create something new. So step one, the first thing that you need to do is assess your level of mind. Okay, you've got to notice where your mind is at. Are you in the try harder cycle? So we help leaders identify what their try harder cycle is. By bringing awareness to your try harder cycle, you circuit break that automatic pilot. The next step is relax your mind. And we teach leaders how to work with their breathing to actually slow their thinking. Some breathing techniques, really simple, really easy. You can do it in the moment. They act as a natural tranquilizer. Now this isn't relax, chill back, kick your feet up. It's just get ready for the next two steps. These two steps are about preparing your mind. The next two steps are about activating creativity and activating incubation. So the next step is construct your problem. So once you've slowed your thinking, you're more centred, you're relaxed, we want you to go back to the problem, but we want you to do a creative review of that problem. Now what that means is we get leaders to physically build the problem, the opportunity or the challenge. Now the reason we do that is that tactile activity activates more neural networks, the creative part of the brain, which we believe is the parietal, it's a seat of imagination, but it also gets you to see the assumptions that are driving your thinking. 70% of the time, leaders had a breakthrough moment with that stage, just by seeing their assumptions. It also means that you get really clear on the question that you're trying to solve. Now, when you have done as much of that as you need, we then encourage you to walk away, set it aside, Okay, I did get some strange looks from leaders because they thought I was from another planet. Who, you're crazy if you think that I can walk away, blah, da, da, da. So, let me be clear. You need to take a break, at least 15 minutes, and you need to do something else, totally divorced from the problem, and you need, it needs to be slightly mentally engaging. Rubik's cubes, crosswords, Sudoku, read a newspaper. Matt Braid, who used to head up Volvo, was in our study and he's now um, commercial director of V8 Supercars and he reads a newspaper. You just need to do something completely different, minimum of 15 minutes. If you can sleep on it, sleep on it, okay? But you just need a break, a genuine break. Can I just say, you can't fake this. Your brain will know that you are still thinking about it, okay? <laughs> So, we've got to get a handle on this. So, we've got our theory. We weren't happy to leave it at a theory. We wanted to see if it worked. And so, we conducted an experiment. Didn't look quite as bad as that. Well, not really. Um, and I just want to go on record and say that no leaders were harmed in the making of this research. So here we have Adam, he's one of our leaders, and when we say that we wired up leaders, we were serious, okay, we did. So we wired up the, the front, the side, the back, four areas of the brain, left hemisphere, right hemisphere. We, we tracked their heart rate, we tracked their blood pressure, we tracked their autonomic nervous system with a finger clip, 
we wanted to track the physiological events in terms of tracking their anxiety. And then we actually asked them to do two timed creative problem solving tests, so no pressure. Okay, so the experiment was we took a baseline, we taught them extreme thinking practices, we asked them to practice that for 21 days and we brought them back into the lab to see if anything had changed. So did it. Did we see any changes? We saw several changes in the brain, in their brain as a group, and um, I've pulled out three. The first key one was that gamma brain waves increased across the whole brain. Okay, in English, that means that they became more creative, their attention turned inwards, and they were starting to use insight to solve problems. The second thing was that beta brain waves decreased. Translation, they became more relaxed and they started using different brain waves to create insight. The third major change was that the alpha and delta, so alpha's relaxed, delta is sleep. No, no delta in the room. Um, that decrease in the part of the brain called the parietal. And the parietal is the part of the brain that we think is the one of the seat of the imagination. So what that meant was that the parietal woke up and started to do its job. It recruited all the different parts of the brain required to get more creative. So that's what we saw in the brain. What happened in terms of the tests? Well, we saw a general increase in cognitive functioning that had improved by 33% in terms of their test scores. We saw that there was 25% reduction in failed attempts and we saw a massive 63% increase in the number of viable solutions they came up with to solve the creative problems. We also saw a statistically significant decrease, drop in blood pressure and heart rate. Now, what this means is, is that leaders were reporting that they were thinking clearly, they felt they could access ideas more readily, and they felt good, and it was easy. Okay, so we were ecstatic. Now, that's in the lab, but what about in the real world, right? Let's go back to our hero, Michael. So Michael bought his time. He got his two extra days. He put arcs into action and he got an aha moment the second morning of the second day. Now, he needed to have a goal and what he knew is he had to, he had to focus. Costs would be decreased if he could reprocess the rejected freight. So he knew that was the key and goal and intention is really important, extreme thinking. So his idea was to adapt and utilise an existing 2D barcoding bar coding, um, technology, which meant that it eliminated three steps out of the overall process and it could be applied in three different states. It was a single point solution. And it's worth noting that out of all the ideas, remember our group that had been working on it? Out of all the ideas, it was the only idea that ticked all of the boxes at the same time, implemented in three weeks and ended up, in addition to fixing the problem, it ended up actually also winning the company a Green Council Award for their site. So, in finishing, I watch us, I watch us, I watch the community chase this silver bullet out there around that'll make us think smarter, live better, be more innovative. But it turns out that the silver bullet actually never left the chamber. We have one incontrovertible superpower, it's in here. So what we need to do is to learn how it works, learn how to dial it up and work with it. And if we can do that, then our possibilities for shaping our future are endless. Thank you.